Okay. Well, good afternoon, Mike, and thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Now, Mike, of course, you've joined us because you were formerly the librarian for the Voice of America's Sound Recordings Library. And for viewers who aren't aware of this as well, Mike has also been a contributor and a classical editor for Absolute Sound, and he has his own online discographic website. If I have it right, Mike, it's classicaldiscography.org? Yes. And how long has that been in operation? I've been online since 2014, but I've been working on it for 25 years. Wow. Wow. That's uh, that's true commitment. Well, well done. I would like to start, I suppose, by, um, for viewers who are not that familiar with the Voice of America uh, collections as they were, can you please describe in your own words what the collection contained in general terms? Okay. In general terms, let me read you something that was presented to the press back in 1951 on the leaders of music service in those days. Basically, what he said was the purpose of the away music was to include artists such as Joe Stafford, John Philip Sousa, Giuseppe Valdingo of the Metropolitan Opera, Peter Russell, and many others. That gives you a picture of what the collection was attempting to do, which was to reflect as many aspects of American musical culture as were available then on radio and later on commercial records. So a very broad scope in terms of what you're presenting. You were basically presenting American culture musically um, as defined at the time. Yes. And what kinds of programs were these records played on? I presume Voice of America had a whole different suite of, uh, of different kinds of programs. Well, the funny thing is the VOA was not operating only in English. It was operating in 42 different languages. So each of those languages may or may not have had a music program. But if they did, they would come to the library and find what they needed. Mostly, at the time I was there, it was the top 40 or the top tunes of the day, uh, which we tried to collect assiduously. Of course, Depending on the era, those would have been jazz records or not jazz records in the 1950s, I suppose. A lot of jazz records would have been would have been regularly and popularly played in the radio by the time you get to the late 60s, less so. Well, we had Rose Conover at VOA, who was actually a purchase order vendor, which means he's a contractor. Willis had a jazz program called Music USA, which was broadcast on short wave, uh, had many hundreds of thousands of listeners, particularly in those denied areas of occupied Eastern Europe, Soviet Union, China, et cetera, et cetera. And Willis was, had his own library, so he didn't use what we had in our library. On the other hand, if people had a jazz show non-Willis, they would come to the library and use what we had. And he was a fascinating character in a lot of ways, Willis Conover, because amongst other things, he was an American who was extremely well-known outside the United States, but not necessarily that well-known inside the United States because of, of where he broadcast. That's true. When I used to travel for VOA, uh, I would often be asked, did you know Willis Conover? And I said, well, in a manner of speaking, uh, Willis had his own studio, his own studio engineer, his own collection, his own resources. The only time I ever met Willis was in his studio when he showed me his postcard collection from H.P. Lovecraft to Willis Conover. <laughs> That's something. Wow. And and if you, I've been doing a bit of digging into Willis Conover and you know, listening to recordings of his on YouTube, but sadly, there are just not too many of those uh, no. publicly available. But what's fascinating is you, you see how many people in other countries learned English listening to Willis Conover. And in fact, he had that speaking style where he spoke very clearly and slowly and resonantly. And, and that was very attractive to people who were trying to pick up the language. Yes, that was quite deliberate. VOA uh, also had a service when I was there called Special English, which did the same thing without Willis. The pronunciation was very clear and very slow. Like that. I could take a few lessons from that, I think. Mike, can I ask you, just in terms of the collection itself, to get back to the collection, 
for what point does it date? When did BOA start consciously aggregating music in, in these various categories? Well, it goes back to the days of network radio when VOA would record routinely all of the music shows on network radio. And from those, they would extract certain pieces, uh, pop music, show music, and repurpose them into transcriptions, which were then sent overseas. And there's another story here. VOA, Voice of America, broadcast music sounds commercials. Um, that was the uh, ideal purpose of it. Later, when music disappeared from radio, we had to go to commercial records. And that's basically how the collection started in the late 50s. Okay, so the uh, late 50s, because we, when we were looking through the collection, and again, we haven't had a chance, obviously, to go through it thoroughly. That's a, that's a multi-month process. But when we were looking through the collection, we found a lot of things that we thought we'd find, but we didn't find a lot of 10-inch records, which suggested to us that basically before 1955, uh, there really wasn't much collection activity, unless it was collected and that collection went somewhere else. No, it's, it all stayed at VOA. So the 10-inch ten, records didn't form, part, as, as you say, a substantial part of the collection that was, that was earlier when VOA was in New York recording off network radio. Right, right, right. So it's pretty much the LP era on the, the collection. That's right. Okay. So when you first took on your role, and it was 1976 to what year were you the librarian? I was there until 1990. Then I moved on to other library jobs. And in the end, when I retired, I was the head of the art library and also something called audio services. So... In the time that you were there, could you tell us a little bit about how things were acquired? So did you have regular subscriptions to labels? Did you actively go out and purchase? What was, uh, I presume there were probably hundreds and hundreds of recordings coming in every month at, at points, I would think. So how did you manage that? What was the plan, if there was a plan? Well, we had three sources. Uh, one source had disappeared by the time I got there, which was from jobbers or wholesalers, we would say to them, we want all of the RCA this, all of the Columbia that, all of the Mercury this, and they would come in little batches. By the time I got there, we still had radio station services, such as the ones any radio station could get. Plus, we went to the local uh, retailers and had a list of what we needed. Did that come in that way? But the key part of this was to mean to keep up with what was popular uh, and the billboard charts. So you, for instance, have always have a hot hundred as much as you could. And as things came in, you would put them in the empty collection. And there, we also had a way of transcribing the hot hundred on a tape so they could be distributed to the language services so we didn't have to have 42 different copies of the same record. And so Voice America was preparing a kind of Casey Kasem uh, uh, encapsulization for, for different services, yeah? Yeah. Uh, interesting. And the, so if you were looking at the Billboard charts, was it just the Hot 100, or were you also looking at the jazz charts and the R&B charts and the classical charts and so on? Uh, less so. Less yeah. so. The, the good thing was that if, if um, the radio station that service provided us with the, excuse me, with the LP versions, with the cuts, on them already, so we didn't have to. So they already came in. It, it, not everything came in. We didn't have everything that came out, obviously. But the idea was that if we were covered with a 45, that 45 cut would be on the LP of the artist. At least that's the idea. Okay, so when it came to aggregating the jazz part of the collection, it was really based on your own intuition as collectors and as appreciators of the music, as opposed to any sort of set. You were just saying, okay, we're going to get top 20 records from the jazz charts this month or anything like that. Well, fortunately, we were able to get um, cooperation from the uh, people who were reissuing jazz records. So one of the first parts of the Jay Correction that I started were all the reissues from I can't remember what they were, but they were beautifully done reissues for remasterings from 
the first old LPs, which we also had. Maybe the original Jazz Classics series? Uh, probably, but I'm no expert in jazz. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I guess what st uh, struck us as we go through the collection is we realized pretty soon, okay, this is but partly because the card catalog, just partly because how we've encountered things, that this is not a complete collection of, say, Blue Note records or Prestige records or what have you. On the other hand, it certainly is not just a willy-nilly collection. The records that are in the collection are excellent records, and somebody has clearly made a point of gathering the best records of the day or many of the best records of the day. We also notice there tend to be doubles or even triples of our number of records. Now, why is that? Why is that? My predecessor thought it was important to have multiple copies because they would always, our, our broadcasters often didn't know how to treat a record properly. So you want to have at least one clean copy uh, among three, let's say. Uh, and one of the first things I did when I came in in October or November of 1976 was to look at all the extra records that had been accumulated in the library on the floor and said, what do we need these for? We already have it in the collection. These are extras, fair plus. We also had plenty of copies of the Red and Blue Beatles records, too, which you understand why that was there. So I immediately decided those were going to be surplus. That I actually put them out of the outside the library and hope people will grab them. Uh, some people did, but the custodial staff was unhappy with that. <laughs> they, didn't find, they didn't find things they wanted. <laughs> so I, I basically cleaned, cleaned that excess up. But that was the ethos, just you have multiple copies, uh, which is an advantage, I guess, if you have one that's got scratches in it and one that's pristine. Exactly. Keep, keep the pristine one, don't keep the other one. So you guys are coming up with your white gloves and giving these records to the DJs, and there's, then there's uh, the broadcasters, and there's with their coffee and cigarettes and all the rest of it. And uh, yeah, cigarettes, yeah, right? <laughs> um, so, well, that's that's very interesting to think about these uh, boxes of records just sitting in the hallway, and, uh, and people helping themselves. Although it's clear they were not helping themselves to a lot of the jazz records because there appear to be sometimes at least three or maybe four or five copies of some of the records that right. we've, uh, that we've found. Good. So um, can I ask you then, uh, were there, uh, was the process of gathering these records then fairly idiosyncratic based on you and the other members of the team just deciding, oh, we'll pick up X, Y, or Z of certain, of, uh, of certain types of music then? That's hard to say. Um, but we got three from the services helped us enormously. Switching gears a little bit, talking about the most interesting corners of the collection, are there any special parts of the collection, whether those are recordings of real rarity or perhaps of value, those, I guess those things tend to go hand in hand, or acetates or transcription discs or, or concert recordings? Are there, are there pieces like that in there that, that, that you think are of real interest? Well, the transcriptions, you mentioned already the jazz LPs that were VOA labeled. There was also a series of classical VOA label records with the New York Philharmonic, the Boston Symphony, and other organizations which highlighted American music. Those were taken from the tapes that we received weekly from Boston or New York or Cleveland or Philadelphia or whatever. Uh, they would be selected from those performances and put on the LPs. Later, that distribution issue occurred on tape after that, but that was a very small period. As far as the other transcriptions were concerned and all the other older tapes, those were all transferred to the Library of Congress. One set of which happened before I arrived, and the later sets were after I arrived, and I wanted to make sure that as they grew in the space that we had, we were able to transfer those out to LC and start growing another collection of one-off records or tapes, that is. So can we just return to those those white label uh, uh, records, the ones which are on, I don't know whether it's, you refer to it as the Voice of America or the U.S. Information Agency, both both organizations are, yeah. are, are printed on the label. So those you mentioned were from tapes. On the classical side, 
things were coming from Philharmonic orchestras, I guess, from you guys directly. So do you had a set agreement with those orchestras that they would cut recordings of their performances and just send you the master tape? No, we used to get uh, the Philharmonic, pardon me, for instance, in New York, the Philharmonic was on the radio uh, in the 30s and 40s and 50s, right yep, through about 1967. And we, we had a facility in New York that had lines to all of the networks and many of the performing institutions and halls. So we would just take the Philharmonic on a regular basis every week to da 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 Boston Symphony, we, we used to send them tape and they would send us a tape of their uh, program that was being distributed by the Transcription Trust. Later on, the Met would send us sets of tapes. Cleveland Orchestra used to send us sets of tapes. Uh, the Philadelphia Orchestra used to have a radio series, briefly, and then they had their local series of concerts. We didn't get those. But we did get an enormous amount of stuff in that in that fashion. And so, with respect to the jazz concerts, then, because if, so if that's what happened with the uh, with the classical, so were the jazz concerts also recordings from the radio, or were they made in clubs? Where did those recordings they, come from? No, uh, well, we already had a recording van which was used most prominently at the Newport Jazz Festival, and the producer and engineer would drive that up and set up the microphones, and Willis would introduce the program that we were taping in mono. Uh, those tape were uh, then taken apart, and Willis Conover got a copy, of course, and he used some of those on his program. Uh, and as an example, the one famous example is the Mont Coltrane concert, uh, which was discovered by a friend of mine at the Library of Congress. Because the tape was not labeled properly, it was a it was a benefit concert that Willis Conover uh, was presenting in Carnegie Hall. There were two sets of concerts, and Coltrane was part and Buck were part of a whole series of present of uh, performances there, and that was a typical VOA uh, off set up. And this is how we end up with that commercial release of that great uh, Mike Coltrane record just a few years ago is through that process was completely unknown to anyone, completely unknown. That was the problem with the instantaneous records of things that we did on our own, was the documentation was, shall we say, a little bit inadequate. Well, that was my next question, because which was going to be, before I learned about the fact that the Monk Coltrane recording was in there, is there any kind of, of, of compendium of information about those recordings which Conover made? Those were all made by... Conover effectively as he went to present a concert, or were there other concerts and gigs that were recorded as well? Well, Willis was the was the host, but Con Willis's connection with that was separate from us. Although Willis had lots of contacts in the business, so if, presumably if he had something he wanted to be recorded, we would go get permissions uh, from the local 40, 47 local what is it five out what the number is in New York. Anyway, we would, we always danced first and got a signature. So we weren't in the position of doing something that an artist would say, oh, no, I didn't say you could do that. And they would make sure you had all the permissions in writing. So that when you did something, you were going to trip up on some regulation or other problem. So I'm recalling one record which we dug out of a box uh, that first time we had a look through the collection. And it was a recording by Jerry Mulligan's group, I think from the late 50s. It was the version that had Bob Brookmeyer in. I scratched my head to think exactly when that would have been. So that recording may or may not have been made at Newport. It might have been made, for instance, at another venue. It might or might not have had Willis Conover presenting the program which was recorded or the, the right. concert which was recorded. Now, were the Conover recordings, do they typically include his intro on the on the tapes? Would you typically have had some of that? Uh, well, they were all taped, but his intro was usually left off when they were used. He would introduce them live. He were, was playing a Newport cut or two or from the festival date of so-and-so. He would introduce them in the studio and then play the track. So he didn't play his own intros, which are you know pretty long and 
pretty discursive and really enough what you wanted to hear. Well, he was very good at it. <laughs> well, yeah. It, well, he was, well, to say the least, um, one of the great presenters of our time. He, um, uh, so with respect to these records then, so for instance, that, that Mulligan uh, Brookmeyer recording, mm -hmm. how many of those would have been pressed and what would have happened to those pressings? Well, pressings would have been distributed to USIS posts overseas and they would in turn be offered to local broadcasters. Here's a country from the OA of so-and-so. Here's a record of such and such. Uh, the classical records would be, here's an American orchestra playing American music, the Canadians, of course, would say Canadian music. And only Canadian music gets on Canadian airways, I know. But that's <laughs> not quite true. CanCon, as we say that's here, right. Canadian content. So that would mean then, arguably, that that Mulligan record, there might just be a couple hundred extant copies, and those would have been distributed worldwide, or? Yeah. they. Uh, as I recall, we had some metal parts of saw those records that ended up in the library, but they were useless to us. They, um, uh, they, they were done well before I got there, so I knew of their existence because I had been through the collection once or twice and said, oh, this is interesting, and that's interesting. Uh, they would have been made from uh, air shots, maybe, but from concert recordings, possibly. So the only way to be sure is to go to the Library of Congress and see if the tapes are there. But you don't know definitively where that metalwork is, for instance. No. No. You didn't have any metalwork that came with you, did We you? didn't. Well, we haven't seen any. You know, certainly, I think we would have noticed it because it would have been heavy. Yeah. So I, I, who knows, for all we know, it's still a VOA or it was given away for scrap or who knows. I mean, such as, you know, everything's ephemeral, right? Can I ask then about uh, the relationships that Voice of America had with other cultural institutions? So you yourself used to work for the Library of Congress. Right. And I guess there would have been other big public institutions that were involved somehow in broadcast media, I'm thinking the Armed Forces Radio and, and other institutions like that. Did you have relationships with them? Did you provide them with materials? Did they send you materials? What were those kinds of relationships like? Well, when I got to VOA, uh, I said, well, there's some interesting older content materials that we could offer to, let's see, the BBC. So I visited the BBC in March of 77 and, and I said, oh, we have this. They already received our Cassell's festival tapes. And they commented on the quality of voice. And I said, well, I have these other things, older things that you might be interested in. NBC Symphony, for instance. And they said, yeah, we're interested. So I would retrieve those tapes from the Library of Congress where they, where they were now stored and make copies and send the copies over to the BBC. And you can actually look on the BBC program database and see where they show up. So we were servicing the BBC. Radio France is another outfit that I wanted to make contact with. Uh, and as far as the broadcasters are concerned, those are the only two I personally had anything to do with. Did VOA maintain its own discrete recording studios, per se, as opposed to broadcast studios? Mm. No. So anything which was recorded at VOA, I was thinking about your tape transfer uh, discussion, and I, and I assumed, therefore, that you're just working with various reel-to-reel -reel machines that you had mm -hmm. in, this, in, the, in the broadcast studios, and you would just repurpose those. Okay. So, therefore, again, getting back to those Voice of America uh, records, what some of those have been live recordings of performances in the broadcast studios. Did that ever happen? Do you know? No, we were not in PR. We didn't have a studio. Right? Well, let me let me correct that by saying if a solo guitar player came in and wanted to play on one of the music shows, yes, we could accommodate that person, but not a band. Not a so band. Not, a, not an organ. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's right. We didn't see, have an organ. See Jimmy Smith with a with a dolly uh, in the elevator. Yeah, I can't quite see that happening. Yeah. So it's a large collection. You know, as you know, both uh, my colleagues and I are, are working hard to figure out how we can approach all this most coherently and make sure that we identify those things which really do need to be identified in there. Well, what, uh, 
What challenges did you have in managing this collection? I didn't have any because, in fact, as I thought about this the other day, uh, I was I was mainly a supervisor in the direction to where I thought things would go. Um, I helped help but didn't design the first database that was done with our IT people. Uh, so I wouldn't say I was essential to the operation. We already had good staff people. Um, that original database, you know, was that written on something like Lotus 1, 2, 3, something like that? Is it still, does it still exist? Which is someplace at VOA. I can't tell you where. <laughs> Mike, can you tell us, uh, as you think back at your time there, are there some stories that stick out in your mind or some experiences that stick out in your mind from, from that time, just about, about that collection and about the people that were involved in it? Well, the biggest thing that ever happened, we moved to the library. This is really bureaucratic. Uh, in 1984, the library had been located in the south building yeah. of the HHS complex. And we were connected to the north building where the studios and writers were by a, a underground tunnel. So people had to, had to go through the tunnel to get to us. Well, we finally decided we get to move to a new place, but it had to be in the basement. It had to be in the basement because the records were too heavy to go anyplace else. That's what the building people told us. I think they're company. <laughs> but I was always in the basement while I was at BOA, right through my end in my career. Always in the basement. Never saw the sunlight. Yeah, no, it's I have I have uh, I have related experiences. I, I don't buy the story about the weight of the records either, frankly. But it's uh, um, it's convenient. Yeah, <laughs> it is exactly. It's Tales from the archival front lines. It's a remarkable yeah. building, isn't it? It's uh, it, it, we got a very well. He said it would be a five minute tour. We looked at each other and thought, well, you can't tour anybody around this building in five minutes. In fact, this is one of the producers there who actually gave us about a forty five minute tour. But he did show us those spectacular murals uh, in the right. in the in the main in the main lobbies, and apparently. Uh, I've been corresponding with another of your colleagues who reached out because they've seen the video. Who was that? And, well, I'll, I, <laughs> I, I should have made a note to remember. But in any event, what he told me is that for a while during the McCarthy period, those murals had to be covered with uh, with with cladding because they were seen to be too yeah cummy. Yeah, exactly. So that was uh, that lasted for a while, apparently. Well, the interesting thing about that building was that it was originally built for the Social Security Administration. Uh, and what was the VRE auditorium on the floor where the mules are was supposed to be the hearing room. Well, the war changed all that, and that was repurposed. Uh, VOA didn't get to that building until 1954 when the whole operation was built for New York, right in the middle of the, in the end of the McCarthy period when USIA was formed. And VOA had become part of USIA. It had been part of the State Department after the war and almost died uh, a couple of times in the late 40s until powers that be found fit to keep it running because the Russians were on the march and we needed to have something on the air to counter them. And suddenly, cultural diplomacy was all the rage. I reminded two of the, uh, of the State Department-funded tours that jazz musicians would take, like they would send uh, people like Louis Armstrong and Duke and other people off of these big junkets around the world. Yeah, that was, that was the outreach of American culture. And some of that was, of course, financed by that agency we shall not mention. Um, but, but, but we also, for instance, uh, we had the... Um, Music was played at the Brussels World Fair in 1958, uh, and also concerts that were done there. So it's an enormous amount of stuff. That was probably one off. Um, but the whole purpose of the operation was to, you know, the array programs include the best of the musical programs heard in this country with the commercials removed. Good music is regarded by Black Horse of America officials as one of the best books for men for this country. That's a quote from 1949. Yeah. It didn't change. It didn't change. When I was there, it was still the Cold War. Uh, we were supposed to reflect what was 
question was supposed to reflect what was, if not best, most characteristic of American culture. I think it did that. Yeah, is there anything else, Mike, that you would share with us about this collection and, and your time there? Well, uh, it was interesting that we had a, a, a couple of our alumni had a lunch the other day, and one of the alumni who was very uh, smart guy said, well, I divided the collection size by the amount of money, and it turned out to be like 59 cents per item. Uh, if you're, let's put it this way, if you're a Cherry Vale collector with Grace Hits in Mono, this is where you want to go. If you're a Sergio Frankie collector in Mono, this is where you want to go. Otherwise, you're SOL. <laughs> there's, there's some good, the, the, the older, the, as, you, as you mentioned before when we talked, the jazz record, the early Blue Notes and Prestige and the Rudy Van Gelder records, you know, are really important to have, but they're not in stereo. They're in mono. But if you want the performances, uh, then they're really important to have. It's... I would say some of the classical things are of interest, but they're also in mono in the LPs. Um, so as far as that's concerned, um, and I have no knowledge of what happened after I left, it was that their business, this is my new business over here. Well, I would say that when it comes to the jazz collecting world, there is a robust grouping, I would say, which prizes those monos above all else and, uh, and, for whom that is no disincentive. So, uh, but anyway, well, it's going to be very interesting to see what we come up with there. And we're going to be continuing to make some videos about what we're finding. And hopefully, Mike, we might be able to reach out to you again at a certain point if we have some other questions. But it's really kind of you to join us today. Excellent. Okay. Thanks Thank ever so much. Bye-bye.